Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to this evening's uh, lecture by uh, Professor Stephen Holmes. It's a great pleasure and an honor to have you back here, uh, Stephen. For those of you who were here with us when we inaugurated the Albert Hirschman Center for Democracy, you may remember that uh, Stephen Holmes was our uh, inaugural speaker. And so it's wonderful to have you back here exactly a year later. Professor Holmes is the Walter E. Meyer Professor of Law at the NYU, and he has taught at Yale, at Harvard, Chicago, and Princeton, where he was also a member of the Institute of Advanced Study, which was home to Albert Hirschman for many, many years. And as he recounted on the occasion of his previous visit here to the Institute, he has had the privilege to interact with Albert Hirschman personally during his time at Princeton. Stephen Holmes' research centers on the history of European liberalism and the theoretical foundations of liberal democracy. He has written extensively on the disappointments of democracy and of economic liberalization after 1980. Nine, focusing especially on state building in post-communist Russia and Russian legal reform. His writings have also dealt with the near impossibility of imposing rules of democratic accountability on the deep state. Most recently, he has addressed the difficulty of combating international Salafi terrorism within the bounds of the Constitution and the rule of law. Besides numerous publications on the history of political thought, democratic and constitutional theory, state building in post-communist Russia, he, as well as on the war on terror, his publications include uh, the book on anatomy of anti-liberalism, passions and constraints, the theory of liberal democracy, Matador's Cape, his book with the subtitle America's Reckless Response to Terror, and most recently, The Beginning of Politics, Power in the Biblical Book of Samuel. For those of you who recall Stephen Holmes' lecture here a year ago, it was provocatively titled, How Democracies Die. For those of you who have seen the latest issue of Foreign Affairs, you will notice that they have borrowed his title and have gathered together several articles under the heading, Is democracy dying. One issue that his lecture touched upon the last time only briefly in passing was the transformation of the media and the problems of sustaining a public debate in the age of fake news, which will be his theme this evening. As most of you know, fake news has been big news, has been very much in the news of late. One of the questions people are asking is, how new is this phenomena, since we know of disinformation from campaigns, especially in times of war, since several decades. This is something which is not unknown to us from the Second World War, especially. Both manipulated stories, um, uh, false information, and now especially manipulated images to add to that as well. Apart from widespread mistrust that these kinds of false and disinformation campaigns have produced, the question is, what other effects have they had on democracy? What do they tell us actually about the state of democracy? Because the production of fake news is only the supply side of the story. Is there a demand side? Who, why is it that so much of it is being consumed? By whom and to what effect? Of course, respect for facts, as we have seen most recently, in attacks against academic freedom, in attacks against scientific expertise, have increased enormously of late. And the question is, what can academics do in an age of what some people have called the post-truth paradigm? Are there legal remedies? Are there public discussions which would help us counter these at universities. And of course, Stephen is especially in a good position to answer some of the questions which are being raised at the moment about the role of one particular country in the production of fake news, not only the US, but also Russia. 
thinking at, looking at Russian information wars and looking at the effects that they have had, not only on the US elections, but also on relationships with the European far right more generally, and therefore on the fate of democracies worldwide. So thank you very much for accepting our invitation, Stephen, and the floor is yours. everybody. It's great to be here. Thank you, Shalini. That was a nice introduction. And it's a great topic, all of us. Uh, it concerns all of us, as you know. So liberalism, in the political sense, has been uh, criticized and attacked since its inception. Now, when liberalism, vague term, umbrella term, began, is a, it's, like, it's like in geography. Nobody knows where the river begins. But it, it's connected clearly with the Enlightenment tradition. And since the 18th century, uh, liberal thinkers have been criticized. In the 20th century, the two main enemies of uh, liberalism, liberal democracy, were communism and Nazism. But today, liberalism is facing, liberals are facing a different kind of threat, a different enemy, a different challenge. Um, and in the US, which has been since World War II, the most important great power supporter of the liberal idea, liberalism is facing a challenge from within, as Shalini just said. A kind of challenge, I have to say, that my friends and I, we, it remains somewhat incomprehensible to most of us. That is, there's something mysterious about it, hard to understand. Uh, Washington Post has a slogan now, democracy dies in darkness. This is relevant to the last lecture. But the point is, now it's not happening in darkness. It's, we're seeing these uh, basic norms crumble in front of our eyes, and we don't seem to be able to stop it. Uh, the, this anti-liberal wave, in the US at least, um, is, is uh, hard to understand. I'm going to try to say some things about it to put some order in it. It doesn't have a name yet, this uh, movement. It has, well, it has many names. Illiberal democracy is one. I'll come back to that. But let's call it, for our purposes tonight, post-truth populism. So um, uh, I want to try to make some sense of what it is, its nature, its scope, the scope particularly of politically successful presidential mendacity in the United States. I will say a, word, a few words about Russia, but I'm going to be focusing on the US. To explain, I want to expl try to explain the conditions that made it possible and the likely consequences and the problems we have in dealing with it. Now, Shalini's, of course, right. All presidents lie. I mean, this is, a, if you've seen, there's a wonderful Ken Burns series on Vietnam. It's a 14 part series. You've seen it's very good, and it has, in a way, shockingly, uh, you see John, Kennedy and Johnson both saying privately, the Vietnam War is a disaster. We can't possibly win. There's no hope. But there's an election coming. So, because we're being attacked by the Republicans, we have to stay in. So they're lying. And they're admitting they're lying. In the end, there's Kissinger saying, oh, we, you know, South Vietnam is going to be swallowed by the North Vietnamese, but let it happen in 73, because in 72, there's an election, which means that democracy produces mendacity. I mean, because you're, you're facing a competition, you have to, and as Schumpeter said, you can't fool all the people all the time, but you can fool enough people long enough to do irreversible damage. So if you lie just until the election, then it's irreversible. And that's very much uh, what you see. John Mearsheimer, my uh, professor at the University of Chicago, has a book called Why Leaders Lie. And one of his main points, he, he admits, of course, that there is the big lies of the Nazis and the big lies of the communists. But democratic leaders lie. Actually, they have more motive to lie because their citizens trust them or should trust them to some extent. So they have, there's a context that uh, leads them to lie. And he, however, is thinking mostly, and this is what we're not talking about here, he's thinking of strategic lying, lying in order to deceive. And something else is going on here. And in fact, I think one way to start to see the peculiarity of our situation with Trump and his lies, which are in some way, they're not exactly strategic law, they're not exactly meant to deceive, is to think about what he said about uh, NATO's Article 5. The memoirs, the great memoirs of, uh, of Kissinger and McMahon and, so, and others were about Article 5. They said, look, we know that if uh, the Soviets invade Western Europe, 
we're not going to do anything because no matter how bad uh, Soviet occupation of Europe would be, it's not as bad as a nuclear war. But we're going to say that we're going to respond with nuclear weapons. So we're going to lie, strategic lie. So Trump, not understanding strategic lie, just goes out and said, no, we're not going to respect Article 5 for no reason. In other words, he doesn't quite understand what a strategic lie is. And I think that's a, a kind of a, a window onto his, the oddness of the man's uh, personality, but also his position. Now, uh, the great uh, Masha Gessen, uh, uh, who writes about uh, mostly on Russia, but also in the States, tries to compare Putin and Trump and says, for both of them, the lie is the message, that is, the point is, you lie in order to show that you have power. And this, I think, very well fits Putin. When he uh, went in to see Angela Merkel at the beginning of the uh, invasion or the uprising in eastern Ukraine, he, she said she showed him pictures of Russian tanks in eastern Ukraine. And he said, Angela, you know, my army is so corrupt, they just sell their tanks. You know? So he was judged, and this was very offensive, she, he was joking, but the point was to show that she could do nothing about it. He could, and this is not a lie meant to deceive. It's not meant to deceive. In fact, it functioned to show power because it was immediately clear that it was a lie. But nothing could be done. And this is a typical of the of the Putin system. He rigs elections. Everybody knows they're rigged. They don't deceive anybody. Nobody thinks they're fair elections. He selects the opponents. But no one can do anything about it. So it is a way of showing power. And it's a, you know, there were elections in Soviet time, fake elections in Soviet time. So in a way, faking elections is a way of pretending to have more power. He, you know, he doesn't really govern that country. The country's Pretty ungoverned, uh, actually. But it, it, part of the messaging is to try to show yourself, pretend to have more power than you have. They call it managed democracy, but what it's really feigning or imitating is management, not democracy. Nobody thinks he is a Democrat, but people could imagine, well, he can run an election that makes him seem powerful. So showing you're powerful. But I don't think that's a very good analogy for Trump. More closer to the Trump syndrome is the... Uh, Moscow, well, the claims you hear in Moscow media and so forth that, the, um, that Scotland Yard uh, uh, staged the uh, uh, Skripal poisoning with the nerve agent in order to uh, bring, to attack the, so it's a, that's fake news. That's a inter interjecting into the media uh, cybersphere uh, a confusion, something that's distracting, a different narrative, an opposite idea. Uh, to weaken or, or, or befuddle or blur uh, the accusation. And that brings us, of course, to fake news. Now, the first thing to say about fake news is it is a double concept. It means two things. They're related, but you have to distinguish them. First is manufactured disinformation. The classic example of this, which was the one of kind of effective piece of fake news in the, uh, in the 2016 election was that the Pope endorses Donald Trump. That's just uh, basically manufactured disinformation. And, but the second meaning of fake news is not manufactured, it's, well, it's related. It's an accusation, it's fake news as an accusation, not as a description, as an accusation aimed at critics meant to raise doubts about the veracity and neutrality of the critics and to preemptively discredit any criticism that they may lodge. In other words, it's trying to undermine the efficacy of adversarial journalism. And this use, that is the use of the category, of the accusation, fake news, is spreading everywhere. I don't know, I just saw yesterday, uh, we saw in, uh, in uh, Vienna the film of the Chinese oligarch who said, you know, they say I only paid 67 million, but I paid 89 million. That's a, that was fake news. I like Trump because he gave me this category. In other words, people who are tr trying to brag or lie or uh, avoid uh, scrutiny or to uh, challenge what other people say about them, they use this category. And that usage is particularly among autocrats, Philippines and so on, a fake news. Now, the relation between these two meanings, the descriptive and the accusatory, is the key to understanding the epoch or the age of fake news. Donald Trump is a fake news proliferator. The most important example is the birther myth that uh, uh, Obama 
well, is a Kenyan born, born Muslim. Because he was born out of the country, not born in Hawaii, he is not, was not eligible to be president of the United States, and therefore that his presidency is illegitimate, fake, feigned. Now, did anyone believe that? That's the question. So it's fake news. But was it, did it create a belief? One of the questions here is what is a belief, of course. Um, when he was asked, why do you tell people this? Why do you say that Obama is not part? He said, you know, when I say this, people love it. So he gets an emotional reaction. He, people were, he found a response in people. He excited them in some way, and he liked that. It was an emotion. He was raising an emotion, finding an emotional reaction. And as Shalini just said, you know, this is not, it's not new, the idea that emotion and prejudice play a big role in opinion, public opinion, belief. Walter Lippmann, 1922, talking about World War I, made this whole point that human beings live in a pseudo environment created by their selective incorporation of information, mostly selected in order to bolster their self-respect some way that they're telling a story, people tell stories in which, they're in, in which they are a protagonist and a hero and a good person, and they absorb that information that way. They, they definitely um, uh, interpret any ambivalent evidence that they find to bolster their previous beliefs and their previous, the beliefs that give them a, a, a greater, more positive self-perception. Uh, but the birther lie, that Obama was a Kenyan barred Muslim, is not really meant to deceive. It takes us in a different realm, and this is what post-truth is about. Now, Hannah Arendt said in her book on totalitarianism, she said, um, in a totalitarian system, statements of fact dissolve into declarations of purpose. Statements of fact dissolve into declarations. In this case, I think it's, we can change that, we can revise it so that statements of fact dissolve into declarations of membership. What group do I belong to? I belong to the group that can't believe a black man could be president of the United States. I, I'm not accepting that, that and black children will run around the White House. I, I refuse. That's my identity. That's who, who I associate with. It's not, you know, if you ask, is it really true that Obama was born in Kenya? It's, not, it is almost irrelevant here. Um, uh, an example, I have a good example of this funny one. In my apartment in New York, I have a, uh, a superintendent who comes from uh, Malta. So he's an immigrant, and he loves Trump. In fact, on the day I voted for Hillary, of course, I'm going to vote, and he came down, he said, Professor, I don't care what you say, I'm going to vote for Trump. And then I saw him months later, and it was the day after Trump had, you remember the story of the black football players kneeling, uh, protesting against the shooting of black youth uh, by a white policeman for no reason. And uh, Trump was very angry with them, said that they hated America and so on. And so Larry, my superintendent, came to me and he said, Trump is great. He really showed it to those rich black guys who, who, who and he said this, he said, who came to this country and then spit on the flag. You know? who came to the country like him. So he had an image of oh, kind of a funny one. I did try to explain to him how blacks came to the country, but it didn't. Um, <laughs> he was, it was a very uh, strong emotional thing. And of course, these are, there's a groups of people for whom the most horrible insult to their lives is that they can't look down on blacks. Uh, because, uh, and having Obama as president, having a Harvard educated, articulate guy like this, it was just, really impossible to absorb, and they emotionally identify with that message. It's nothing to do with, was he born in Kenya? It is really about that. It's more, a dis it, it relies not on deception, but on what Harry Frankfurt in his little book called Bullshit, which means a, a denial of the very difference between truth and falsity. So it's as if that difference doesn't matter. What matters is loyalty to a group or belonging to a group or what is yourself identity. It is an attack, a direct attack on democracy, this statement, because after all, Barack Obama was elected. What it says is, doesn't matter if you're elected, you're not president if you're not the kind of person I want you to be. 
And this fits with Trump's rhetoric during the campaign. If Hillary were elected, I would not accept her legitimacy. Or also lock her up is the same thing. The American democratic system, or any democratic system, depends on you know, basic rules that if you lose an election, you're not going to be put in jail. That's like a, because if, if the incumbent or if the other side thinks they're going to be put in jail, that destroys the capacity for compromise and alternation in office and so forth. So Trump became president attacking the core norms of democracy. And this, and the birther lie, which he continued, he said, it's actually very funny. Um, he said in 2015, I think, 14, that we should all thank him because he forced Obama uh, by, uh, by pressing this to, to, to uh, release his uh, long form birth certificate. And he was, he was accusing Obama of being born in Kenya in, until 2015, but Obama had released his birth certificate in 2011, so it was hard to get the chronology correct. But it doesn't, see, that's another example. Is that, is that a, it's just a confusing way of talking. He thinks he can say such things without being challenged. He can get away with it for reasons we'll talk about. When we shift attention to the second uh, meaning of fake news, to the way uh, an accusation of being a, 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 a purveyor of fake news um, and how that's used politically, the chutzpah is actually amazing. He, you know, here is a, um, Trump, who was attacking Obama throughout his presidency for being illegitimate. When he became president, he starts saying, you know, how can anyone criticize the president? This is such, this is les majeste, you know, I'm the president. How could people talk about me this way? They're trying to humiliate me. How could anyone try to humiliate a sitting president, and so on. So this was his uh, whiny protest. In fact, one of the funny times that uh, Putin and uh, uh, Trump met, I'm not sure where it was, somewhere in Europe, uh, and Trump, as our Putin, pointed to the reporters and said, these are, are these the people who hurt your feelings? Because um, he is that kind of whine, whiny weakling, among other things. But um, OK, so uh, incredibly, Despite the First Amendment, which is an important part of the American political system, he has openly and continuously said that the free press is the enemy of the people, that uh, journalists hate America. Anyone who criticizes him, who doesn't applaud, hates America. And he actually, in some ways, encourages uh, maybe violence against them. He's not quite sure. He points them out. He calls them by name. He's, he is uh, he's attacking them personally, and he, he would, I think, feel like if he could ruin the career of a couple of journalists, that would be a, a great deterrent to future um, attacks. He's certainly calling them all partisan hacks who hate America. So taken together, Trump's fake news, because it's his, both kinds, the points he pervades and the accusation of fake news, because this is accepted by the followers. As Shalini was saying, why, why, why is it accepted? What is it? Well, it's this we have to think about through, think this through, but it is what we have to understand the extent of what is accepted. What's accepted is an attack on American democracy. That's not just some lie about Obama. It's except something deeper. Um, uh, okay, before going more deeply into this, this challenge of post-truth post populism to liberal democracy, I want to locate these two versions of fake news in the context of Trump. I'm going to talk more about Trump himself, um, his, more, his compulsive, natural mendacity, you might say. Now, he was an accidental president in a way. It was Michigan, it was 70,000 votes, it was Comey, it was, you know, there was a lot of fluke in his becoming president. Nonetheless, um, he is a window into something. We have to look, which I'll do in a few minutes, at the conditions that made him possible, made this kind of post-truth populism possible. But he is fascinating uh, you know, in his own right as an object of study. Uh, first of all, as a little typology, some of Trump's lies are just pointless. For example, he constantly says, I never watch TV. It's like, <laughs> Why does he say such a thing? It's, like, it's absurd, but he does say it. Once he was at Mar-a-Lago, this is before he became president, he was taking a guest around, and he said, you know, these tiles on the floor in this room, they were made by Walt Disney. And the guy happened to be very knowledgeable about this, and he said, but Mr. Trump, that's not true. And Trump looked at him and said, what the hell do you care? 
so like an aggressive, like, well, what is it? What does it mean? I mean, what does truth have anything to do with it? I'm just bragging, you know, I'm just showing off so truth is real. So this is some, uh, something uh, frivolous in a way. Sometimes he seems pretty unhinged as when he told friends privately that the, the Hollywood access tapes were, access Hollywood tapes were, 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 were fake or something. It is, it is, I think, an important principle to keep in mind when talking about politicians, is that you can be a deceiver and also be deceived. I mean, you can, you can be perfectly, you can be deluded at the same time as you're working to uh, delude other people. The, these two things, it's like being a victim and a victimizer. You can be both things. Uh, and he's a good example about that, and we've had other examples in uh, American history. The, in the Bush administration, uh, Cheney and Bush were, had something similar about them. Uh, that's, I think, isn't it Nietzsche who said liars lie to themselves and visionaries, no, liars lie to others and visionaries lie to themselves. That's what it is. Um, so he, he maybe thinks he's a visionary. I'm not sure he visions. He sees visions, perhaps. Um, some other types of lies have their roots in Trump's. This is quite, I think, important to get the background. He has an experience which makes him uh, have a different relation to lies than most of us. I mean, I don't know what your businesses are, but in his business, lying has had a lot of advantages. So, for example, if I sell you a degree to Trump University, and you don't go around saying, I was cheated, it's worth nothing. I mean, it would be a, basically, a, 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 you have an interest in not revealing, how bad, or more materialistically, if I sell you an apartment that is really not worth what you bought it for, you want to resell it. You're not going to talk it down. You're not going to say it's worth nothing. So he, he heard his lies being echoed throughout his life. He would lie he would, as a salesman. Uh, he, would, uh, f he would trick people. He would dupe them. And then, like in a Ponzi scheme in a way, um, uh, people who buy it, they, they want to they resell. They, they, they want to keep it going. Um, even, more, even more deep, even deeper than this, is that is the way in which there's a self-fulfilling prophecy about claiming that you're rich? You know, we have this in power. If I, if you think I'm, if you have an opinion, if you think I'm powerful, that will make you behave in a certain way toward me. It will make me more powerful. So, if I can convince you that I'm powerful, I will be more. It's not quite that simple in wealth, but Trump did in several of his documents. He assigned a monetary value to his reputation for wealth. <laughs> that's all there is. That you think I'm wealthy, that's part of my wealth. I count that. I, I write that down as that's another billion dollars. Um, so if people think you're rich, it opens doors for you. And he was doing this his whole life. So he, his thing about faking, feigning, making people believe something, uh, uh, getting on the Forbes list, calling people, hiding, his debts, to make his assets, to balloon his assets. It was all part of the Trump show throughout his life. And if you read, there are many, many biographies now uh, which are excellent and disturbing uh, to read. But uh, that, I think, is, a, is an important kind of background to his psychology, why it doesn't bother him. He seems to have be not bothered at all by lying. It does, and it's, it's kind of automatic, but it's also something he's almost you know, proud of. Now, even back up a little more. Where is lying almost always permissible in, let's say, moral theory? It's in war. So in war, if you read the laws of war, uh, uh, deceit is perfectly uh, uh, acceptable. You can trick the enemy out into a vulnerable position. You can use feints and deceit and so forth. Trump thinks life is war. I mean, from a very early age, and they're, they're wonderful explanations. His brother died when his brother was young of alcoholism, his older brother. And he said, you know, man is the most violent animal and life is just war. And uh, uh, there's, you're fighting and you, you win or you lose. And there's nothing else to it. Um, there's, no, uh, there's, nothing, there's no higher value, you're just fighting. Now, to get to see how that's relevant to his general outlook, Think of his statement, which was made recently, that I, uh, this is about the Mueller probe, 
He said, I am not obstructing justice. I am fighting back. I am not obstructing justice. I am fighting back. The implication of this is that there is no such thing as justice, just like there's no such thing as truth. Mueller, the FBI, it's like the FBI, the, the Justice Department of the United States, that's just another group that's sort of connected with Hillary, I don't know how he gets that, or the Democratic Party, or my enemies, and they're fighting me, and I'm fighting them. And there's no, nothing just about them, or not just about me either, but I'm just fighting them. And who's going to win? It's going to depend on who's smarter, who's faster, who can afford the best lawyers. He's no longer able to do that. Um, but it's a world of winners and losers, like in his lawsuits. And I have had friends who have, were his lawyers uh, in New York, and they say you know, he never understood the cases, but he would come and he would make the case so obnoxious. He would be so obnoxious. The other people would just kind of go away. Uh, they would like, we want to not have anything to do with this person again because he's such an uh, obnoxious guy. And uh, he would win by bullying. Not, he wouldn't always win, although he, he would always try to hide it when he lost. This is a very radical statement. I am not obstructing justice. I am fighting back, meaning there is no justice. That is completely incompatible with American mythology and American self-love. You know, I'm... That's my age. I'm that age. We, we used to watch Superman on TV and it said, uh, truth, justice, and the American way. So truth, justice, and the American way. That's the American mythology. That's who we are. That's what we believe in. Here's Trump. I mean, of course, it's not, that's kind of nonsense, but it is an American mythology. And Trump is just saying, no, we're just, our, we're just fighting. There is, we don't stand for it. Americans... You know, like in Iraq. We like to go there and <laughs> do terrible things in the name of democracy. <laughs> we like to have an ideal in the name of which we're doing these things. Terrible things. But the idea of doing it with no ideal is just completely un-American. And that's Trump. So that, he, this is a, and the fact that it's accepted that the American president could be, by people who are in some way sort of conservative, I guess, but they're radical. It's a revolutionary uh, idea. That is, and it's connected with fake news. I mean, there is no truth. There is no justice. That's a radical thing to say uh, to an American uh, for whom uh, this is the kind of thing a Marxist would say or, or Putin would say or some member of an English department who would say everything is power. There is no. It's all power. Uh, uh, people, America, you talk values, but it's all just interests. It's just verbiage. It's just hypocrisy. It's a very cynical perspective on America. So how in the hell, in this naive, self-loving, self-idealizing people, how did they elect a guy who is such a cynic, I mean, a complete, who thinks there is no justice? Really, this is mind-boggling. This is why I'm saying we, I have a, we have a hard time getting our arms around what is this post-truth populism, because it's not in a, it doesn't fit well in American traditions. Uh, even though people say, oh, there have been populists before, and, you know, Huey Long, so this is something quite different. Viktor Orban in Hungary was, had a big celebration when Trump was elected. He said, Trump has brought us back to reality. And what he meant by that is that he's rejected this liberal universalism and human rights and refugee rights and all that talk, which was supposed to be, you know, um, somehow authoritative, <laughs> which we know universalism, this is Orban, is just a mask for particularism. You can talk about open, you know, universal rights of refugees, but you're just an interest group, a bunch of liberals, who are trying to dilute uh, the white Christian nation of Hungary. And the white Christian nation of Hungary is not fighting you on the basis of universal values, we're fighting on the basis of our national identity. This is not that far from Trump, really. We are defending our particularism and openly defending our particularism. So, is it, to me, this is, a, uh, again, I, I'm just biographical, my, my, I and my friends. We cannot believe that white nationalism, white supremacy has raised its hideous head again now after these years in a completely mixed race country in which this can only mean violence. So it's a, uh, it's a very uh, hard thing to get your head around that this part of the 
anger, and remember that's again the background here about Obama. Obama's main message to Americans was America can be a mixed race nation and it can still be America. Since America is already a mixed race nation, that's a good thing to, to say, but the Trump voter doesn't believe, doesn't want that to be true. And that's, uh, is a, that's why it is a, in some way a, such a dangerous thing that's going on. Trump's uh, cynicism, or you can say his, uh, his uh, English department radicalism, or his whatever the word is for him, is what's, it's very astonishing to listen to him. So here's some examples. I mean, I think it was uh, Bill O'Reilly or Sean Hannity, one of these right-wing correspondents, was saying to him, look, you know, uh, Mr. Uh, Trump, don't you know that, why do you like Putin so much? Don't you know that Putin kills journalists and, and he's a murderer? And, and Trump just very blithely said, well, you know, we kill a lot of people too. We kill a lot of people. So this is like, how can he say this? No, that's true. I mean, it is true. This is a half true. It's not that it's not true. And I want to get to this uh, really in the end here that uh, truth, um, there's a there's an illusion uh, propagated by uh, our current uh, tr truth heroes, truth heroes like Julian Assange and Ed Snow Edward Snowden, who are, you know, whatever their person, I'm not judging their motives, but they're contrasting truth with manipulation. And that's just a bad contrast. Truth can be manipulated easily. You can say something true and it can be manipulated for bad purposes. It's not a, it doesn't, the fact that you speak truth doesn't mean you're blowing up the world of manipulation at all. And Trump is much smarter than those guys, and he knows this. So he's saying true things. We kill two. He's saying all our politicians are for sale. Ah, eh, that's kind of true. Um, and he's saying, well, no such thing as justice. That's too strong, but that justice is biased, that justice serves people, that you know, if you have a crime committed by a person up on the social ladder, down, if the victim is down, he'll be punished less than the other way around. There's a lot of bias, there's favoritism in the system. You can talk about meritocracy, but it's, it's full of favoritism and so forth. He's not, the things aren't wrong. And even more, it's like extraordinarily, he can kind of uh, attack the New York Times. Um, I mean, it's doesn't really make sense to say that uh, the New York Times is destroying America in league with the FBI, but, uh, but he can attack the New York Times in a way, and there's some truth to it, which we know by the fact that I know, because every morning I get up, I read the New York Times, and my mind is filled with Donald Trump. It's like the last thing on earth I want, uh, and I've been doing it now for more than a year. It's a horrible, this newspaper and all the liberal newspapers have allowed him to breathe all the oxygen. They, and could they stop him? I'm not sure, but they, they are, in a way, in a funny way, they are fake. <laughs> that is, they're, they're purveyors and conveyors and magnifiers of him. They invented him, and he was not, would not be elected without them, would not have been elected. That's another story, but it's a, there's a bit of truth in that, and these half-truths, manipulated truths, that's an important aspect of the Trump, but it's not, it's post Truth, not because there are no truths, but because the truths that are pulled in by Trump and spewed out uh, are manipulated. Now, fake news. Fake news one, fake news two. A good category for understanding what he has done to us is gaslighting. Do you know, is this a term that you know? So there's a movie called Gaslighting. Gaslighting, the, the film, and there's a play, actually, but as a guy, he's trying to drive his wife crazy, and he... Uh, he, he turns the he's upstairs and he turns the lights down and up and down and then she says what's happened he says nothing happened so he tries to he wants to make her crazy by denying obvious things facts he also very typical of gaslighting if you look it up uh, as a psychological category people accuse you of what you do so you do something and then you accuse the other person of doing it that is I do something like I lie and then I say you're a liar and the, the, the consequence of this reversal is that you start having to defend yourself against the accusation, and you're distracted from what I just did. So gaslighting, I think, is a very, it, and it, it's a unsettling and dismantling of your sense of reality, which I have. <laughs> um, so he, he um, in the debate with Hillary, uh, it's very spontaneous. She said at a certain point, you may remember that, 
you are Putin's puppet. And he said, without catching a breath, no, you're Putin's puppet. And I said, you just throw back the accusation. So what is that? Is that a lie? And he's kept this up. If you hear him, if you read his, I don't recommend it, if you read his tweet uh, uh, streams, he's constantly saying, no collusion except by Hillary with the Russians. Hillary is colluding with the Russians. Now, does he mean that? He's trying, of course, what he's doing is throwing out chaff, you know, like an airplane, he's throwing out, you know, noise. Uh, he's throwing out distractions. Um, not trying, again, to convince you that something is true, but the cascade uh, has an effect on your perception. So his lies come not singly, but in battalions. That's a Shakespeare line. And because they come so fast, there are 3,000 lies so far that the papers have, have uh, cataloged. The fact checkers can't keep up with them. Every time they, you know, it takes a day to find out that the lie was a lie, that what he said was a lie. By that time, he said another something that's very outrageous. So you're, it's it's a, a swirl of uh, of information that you can't catch up with. That's again, Jonathan uh, Swift said, "Untruth flies and truth comes limping behind." So you know, this is, goes fast. The uh, the untruths go fast. They they stick. They're interesting. They're they're clickbait. People. Uh, spread them, you hear about them, and then there is a correction, but it, it doesn't matter in a way, because there's something else uh, that's uh, buzzing around in our heads. Partly the shortest, uh, it's not a disinformation campaign, that was a phrase that uh, Shalini used, but it's, again, it's, like, it's kind of an erasure of the distinction. No longer it matters, you know, you can say, oh, it's not true or not true. It seems that people are just, <laughs> They're, they've, it's a surfeit. They've been, it's an overexposure. Um, it is a way of asserting power. This, this, this strategy of just spewing out one lie after another lie after another lie after another lie. I think, you know, uh, it's a funny fact. I don't know. Is that really relevant here? That when there's, m as the information about a person, a celebrity, increases, the percentage, it, it lessens the negative impact of negative information. So if the, even if 50% of the information is still negative, but if there's a lot more, it just doesn't have any impact because just the quantity. And I think Trump has also lived in, in this kind of world. Um, they haven't, nobody, the papers haven't really laid a glove on him in a way. Mueller may do, we don't know, but that's also up in the air. They've tried to subordinate him to their kind of epistemological duty to correct errors when he makes them, but he refuses. And in fact, he basically believes that admitting that you were wrong is a sign of weakness. Never do that. That's an old, this is not new. Uh, you never admit weakness. That's very Putin-esque too. Never show weakness. And admitting error would be a way of giving in to your rivals. Um, okay, now for the wider view and the conditions. This is taking us into technology the conditions that made this monster possible. Um, liberalism is based on, a, a, on an understanding that one of the greatest dangers in politics is false certainty. So false certainty is a problem, and we have to have mechanisms, uh, uh, procedures, like in a, a criminal trial, uh, to put into question false certainty. So the, you know, the prosecutor can come in, he thinks he has a slam dunk case against the accused, but in a liberal system, the accused has some capacity to work with his attorney to pick apart the evidence, to cross-examine the witnesses, to show that, that's not, that the accusation is false, or there was a mistaken identity, or there's some, some mistake. That's possible. So systems for correcting errors and for dealing with the great human, very human, false certainty, all of us have it sometime, and the system, a liberal system, can help us overcome the downsides, bad sides of false certainty. We cannot trust a government, that again is a core liberal idea, we can't trust government to give us the information we need to evaluate the government. This is like obvious, it's like the number one thing. They're not going to tell you the things you need to know to show that they're incompetent or, or uh, maybe even worse. This is why liberal democracy uh, depends on citizens having access to a plurality of sources of information. That's, uh, 
Um, and that's why authoritarian rulers inevitably, uh, the ones who hold rigged elections and so on, why they shut down independent media, why they monopolize television broadcasts and so forth. They want to control what you know. They don't want you to have plural information. But today, and here's our problem, which uh, no remedies here. We have an unbelievable, almost insane, as you, this is a tri trivial, of course, but you all know, a proliferation of media platforms. It's a, almost a parody of media pluralism. And the old idea of liberals, John Milton, who's my favorite, and Aria Pagetica, and Jefferson, and John Stuart Mill, and so on, which is that total freedom of, uh, to print your views and so forth helps rulers keep their, so helps citizens keep their rulers accountable. Um, but you can't really say that about total freedom of the internet. It just doesn't seem to have helped us keep our rulers accountable. That doesn't, doesn't work that way. Something else is happening. And what's happening, part of what's happening, is a fragmentation of political space into these mutually sealed off ideological fortresses between which no serious communication is possible. The accusation fake news is part of that. That is what fake news means as a practical matter. It means you have rival sides, rival camps, each of them saying the other is fake news. And there is no common world. There is no common set of facts. There is no common standard that adjudicates between them. Um, these, uh, are, you can say both parties are calling the other a bunch of liars, a simple way. This is, a, a, from a theoretical point of view, political theory point of view, it's called poisoning the well. That's a, uh, 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 Cardinal Newman had that idea in his Apologia Pro Vita Sua. A poisoning the well is when you accuse the person who's saying something of having an ulterior motive. I mean, it could be the reason you're saying that is because of how you were, what your mother did to you when you were three, or the reason you're doing that is because you're a bourgeois running dog. You know, something, it's, it's trying to destroy the uh, power of any argument you make by attributing to you a bad motive. This is very, and each side does this, and of course I have my preference. It's another, another uh, classical concept that's relevant here is the concept of the evil tongue. It has a uh, biblical um, uh, root. The idea of the evil tongue is you, don't, you, ha you know truth about your neighbor, but you don't say it because it would be hurtful. You shouldn't really do that. It's true, but you shouldn't say it. It has become something much stronger, which is even if something is true, Something about your group is true. You don't say it. You hide it because it could be used by an enemy. So the doctrine of the evil tongue really is saying loyalty before truth. And of course, this has some appeal some of the time, maybe in war or something. But as a general principle, it's very corrosive of democracy. If you start saying, I'm not going to tell you something, you, if you hear we in Switzerland don't want anybody to know about certain things that we do here because then they, some people who have bad motives might uh, exploit this for bad reasons. Can liberalism survive the doctrine of the evil tongue? Can liberalism survive this poisoning of the wells? Can liberalism survive that's my, or survive? Can it handle? Can it manage? Uh, with its idea that this freedom of uh, discussion is going to produce truth, it's going to, you know, bat, the ideas will battle out and truth will conquer, and freedom... Uh, instead, what we have, <laughs> we have this system of these, these bubbles, these, uh, these sealed off communities in which, uh, well, if you watch, uh, which, are in, uh, which are unwatchable by the other side. It's insupportable. I, I cannot read the op-ed page of the Wall Street Journal. I cannot sit and watch Fox News, although they're not turning on Trump a little bit now. But it's very hard to do. I mean, this, and it's a bit bad. You should be doing it. You should be communicating. You should be hearing what the other side is saying. It's very hard to take, and I'm sure it's true on the other side, too. That is this fragmentation, which is really the effective meaning of fake news. Not truth, falsehood, but the, fa the, the fragmentation. Um, it should be said that his, again, the, vote, the people who support him, so you have to, they're really strongly committed to him. Now, there's some reasons for this. One is that they know, this is also interesting as a way of thinking about it, we despise him, we liberals, despise him more for his vulgarity than for his policies. There's something just terrible about having a person 
who tried to rip his wife's hair out when he was mad at her. It was like, you know, something terrible about a guy. I, I urge you to go look on the video, Trump shaves McMahon. If you've ever seen Trump shaves McMahon, you see a guy, he's now president of the United States, He's in, a, in a, a boxing rink in the center, and he's shaving someone's head off as the crowd roars, yay, yay, you should do this. It's a kind of ritual humiliation of a person, which is uh, like the Colosseum. It's fake. I mean, I'm sure they paid the guy to let himself have his, but it's a kind of, alongside the golden toilet or whatever else he has, the crass vulgarity. We don't like, I mean, this is clear. And uh, his voters think we look down on, so it's a looking down on. It's not about, a lot of it's not policy. If you think, who did more damage to the world, Trump or, or Bush? I mean, Trump didn't, so far, didn't invade any countries. Um, it's the vulgarity that's, now, uh, he, he is extremely dangerous, Trump. Not because, uh, he's extremely dangerous because he has totally dismantled the emergency reaction capacity of the American government. So if there is a great emergency, either economic, like 2008, or you know, 300 American sailors die in, in the Persian Gulf or in the South China Sea. He has no capacity to respond. He can't. There's nobody who can call someone. They don't know. He's gutted the diplomatic corps. It's a very dangerous situation because of this. It's we've been lucky. That's the danger. Uh, but uh, really, much of the revulsion is at his uh, terrible vulgarity. They say about him his supporters, that he is the essence of authenticity. I mean, this person who lies every day, he, can't, he lies before breakfast, during breakfast, after breakfast, he's lying. So they mean he's listening to them, he sympathizes with them. Moreover, he did something for them that they've never had before. That, that vote was the first time in their lives that they had an impact on the world. They turned the world upside down by electing that man. They made people like me sick to my stomach. We, they made the New York Times pull out its hair. They never in their lives imagined that they could make the New York Times pull out, <laughs> go crazy. And they did. And he let them do that. And they're never going to abandon him. It has nothing really to do with what he does. It's just he, he gave them a sense of impact on the world that, that, that is irreplaceable. I think they can't. They can't give him up. That's why he's got that 40%. That's so very solid. Um, so, summarize. It's not about the lying. It's not about just about uh, uh, destroying accountability journalism. And it's not just about blurring the false uh, true distinction, but it's about this supporting these extreme polarization with no common world, where it turns out, that's also interesting, that the most skeptical is also the most gullible. That is, you have people who say, I would never believe anything in the New York Times, but then they believe any rumor that they hear on the, read on the internet. About that confirms their beliefs. So they're skeptical, but totally gullible. So it's, it, again, it's, it's membership. It's not really about the truth. They're, they're skeptical, gullible, depending on which group they want to belong to. Um, OK, so um, uh, the, part of this has been made possible, and maybe even inevitable, by the technological uh, uh, possibility of micro-targeting of partisan prejudice and conspiracy theories. So because I can send messages by micro-targeting, I'm not speaking in front of the whole range of opinions. I just find those whose opinions are similar to mine, and I send that message. And therefore, if you're talking to the whole community, you better be kind of sure that you're not saying something that's way off base, because you're going to get some really good big pushback. But if you can separate technologically those you address, you, you produce and you reinforce this kind of uh, balkanized, fragmented, fragmented uh, world. This sealed bubble, uh, pluralism, echo chamber, niche communities of similar thinking people. Um, and uh, you know, this, is, this, I think, is, is really the, one of the key things that he's doing. So now I'm gonna, uh, coming to the end here. I hate really to end on this, uh, on a totally pessimistic note, but um, post-truth populism depends on and reinforces something that I would call the collapse, or has been called the collapse of context. So what I mean by that is we are all uh, uh, subject to a flood of information. There is so much information easily accessible to all of us. 
It's just, I mean, it's always been probably too much information, but now the quantity of information is overwhelming. You cannot look at a piece of information and know that it's true, that it's true. How do you know it's true? In fact, the, the knowledge, well, someone says there was no, whatever, there was a no moon landing. And you say, of course there was a moon landing. But, I mean, did you see the moon landing? How do you know? Well, the reason you believe there was a moon landing is because there is a hierarchy of sources, there are a hierarchy of credibility of sources of information. There is a standard hierarchy of credibility of sources of information. And you rely on that to weed out, to filter. You say, New York Times, we know that if it makes a bad mistake, it's going to be embarrassed. It'll have to retract it. It's going to have some, uh, it will respond to the criticism. So I tend to believe, even though there are a lot of things there that aren't true, still, in general, more than some blogger. Um, it turns out, psychologically, that if you ignore completely the, the uh, uh, different um, uh, sources of the information you're faced with, your biases quickly come. If, you're not, if you don't care about the sources, then all of your biases click in, and you start Find believing it if it confirms what you believe already and disbelieving it if you don't. If there's a hierarchy of sources of information, I say this as coming, you know, with, I'm in a university. Universities are part of a hierarchy of sources of information. The Trump world is attacking universities, of course, too, because it belongs to a hierarchy, elitist hierarchy of, the credibility, of credible sources of information. So the question is, uh, and I would say this is another way. Can you know the this older idea, which are filters, or, and of course there are a lot of things wrong with the procedures that uh, that uh, vet that filter. Uh, like Wikipedia is an example of a system that sort of survived because they have developed a method of correcting errors. It's not perfect, but it can it gets corrected. They have a system. They have a structure. It's not just anything anyone says. You can't just put anything you want there. So this is a procedure, and it's a, it makes it more credible. And it can be used, of course, it's harder. You can't just say what you want there. But it does uh, stand for it. So the question is, um, this, this reliance or, or reaffirmation of a hierarchy of, uh, credible, of the credibility of source of information is, in a way, a kind of undemocratic thing. I mean, undemocratic. We're talking about democracy here, but it's something that is uh, being attacked. It's like a part, and we, we had this, as I, I mentioned, uh, Orban, and Orban has this idea of illiberal democracy, which is a concept, in a way, it's, it, just, it doesn't make sense. He likes Singapore, he's, he thinks China, he's not really in favor of democracy, he, he manipulates elections and so on. On the other hand, there is something to this idea that, um, that there is a democratic resistance to these hierarchies. Uh, that, and that liberalism, uh, and liberalism's devotion to systems for distinguishing between truth and falsehood, uh, and you know, not putting people in jail who are innocent and so forth, um, that system uh, is, uh, is coming, is, is in a way a target of post-truth populism, and the question we have is can we uh, uh, fight back? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Stephen, for this um, uh, talk. I'm going to just uh, hand over the mic to uh, whoever has a question in the interest of time. Rafael. Thank you so much for a provocative question. Uh, one of the things I wanted uh, to ask you is your whole issue of truth. You seem to be saying that truth is not a concern for these people. Lying is not a concern, but it's a concern is simply validation vis-a-vis -vis the enemy, right? Uh, but you know, can we say can we say that the games of truth have changed? I mean, you know, I remember I, I, the game of the truth and, and the false, as Foucault would say, changes historically, right? Because, truth for ordeal, for example, which is a case by ordeal. That was the truth. I mean, when when Americans, white Americans, say Barack Obama is not an American, they are not lying. That's true. It's a fundamental, deep truth. I mean, 
Someone who is not white by definition cannot be an American, and it's as simple as that. So what has changed, that by, by for, uh, for the American, for the minority, for white supremacist Americans, by definition, someone who is not white is not American. Is it already on? Yeah. In which they ask, can a person with dark skin be Polish? And it was 100% no. So that wouldn't quite be true in America. But you are completely correct that at the founding, you know, whiteness was created in America. There were not millions of Indians and millions of blacks in Europe. So in Europe, this was just a heterogeneous population. But when they came to America, whiteness became very salient. And when Thomas Jefferson and others said, uh, we're, create, we're seizing this land for ourselves and our posterity, they meant white people, for sure. So the white supremacists today have a claim to be connected with the founding. Now, I protest against this. There are a lot of intervening things. However, they are, they're not wrong to have a kind of claim to the, a legacy claim. They've got the claim that they are the legatees of original tradition. And uh, those of us who don't like that or are against it have to face the fact that there's truth. In our history, that was the case. It was a white country. And it was for white people. And there were laws. You could only become a citizen if you were white. But at the, at the very beginning, in the middle of the 1750 or so, Tom, say Ben Franklin, he didn't want those Germans there. But then in a few years, he realized we need them. We need them to come help us clear the land and kill the Indians and so forth. We need them. So they opened up to whites. Um, so you're, you're, you're right. I mean, I, this is, I mean, I'm not sure what, I, maybe I haven't answered your, your question. But of course, truth, the thing is, when Trump talks like a radical and he says almost like there is no such thing as truth or what it's all truth, it's all relative, he does talk that way. And of course, there is something to it. I mean, maybe it's, I don't think he's read Foucault and so forth. That wouldn't be it. But he, he is. No, he doesn't. He's actually <laughs> unable to read. That's one of the secrets of, of Trump. Um, yeah. you want to finish the question? No, no. My question is that it seems that we have to face the issue that the, the, the very nature of truth is changing. Okay. I mean, and that's it's changing. Well, good. I mean, the, the kind of truth you're you're talking about depends on a certain appeal to the universal and the denial of internal conflict. I mean, external. I mean, I remember here a wonderful book by Nicole Loro. The divided city on Athens. I mean, external war is where glory is to be found. There is a pact among citizens to forget internal division. Okay, but let's take the example of ExxonMobil that was spending millions of dollars preparing for climate change while it was not paying people to deny climate change. So that's just, okay, so you, you can't, so there is truth. There's, we're, we're in a realm where you can't just say there's no such thing as truth. They were really just lying. Now, the thing about that's just a lie, for, like the tobacco companies who lied about cancer. Trump is in a different realm. You're right. He is, he's floating in this soup where it doesn't seem to matter. And his followers, his supporters, don't care. That's what's amazing. They don't care that he's saying things that aren't true. Because they, fundamentally, they are true. OK, well, that that's, I'm not sure that's about. That's anyway. All right. To them, they are true. That's, uh, that's what I'm trying to say. I think rather they don't care as opposed to being true. Uh, yeah. um, good evening. Uh, my name is Helen Hahn. I'm a student here at the Graduate Institute. Um, I'm going to go back to something that I noticed after the election. And I can only speak for Austrian and German newspapers, but I assume it's, uh, it's the same in the American case, which is that there were lots of psychologists, psychiatrists, journalists, et cetera, et cetera, who were offering their assessment of uh, Trump's mental state, his psyche, sort of as an explanation as to you know how this happened and what we can expect. And so I noticed in your presentation as well that you were offering some of views or your views on Trump as a person. And I think I feel a bit ambivalent as to what the purpose of this is, because I wonder whether it renders the American public, maybe not so much people in Europe and outside of the US, whether it renders them passive, because it gives them kind of an excuse to just accept the way that things are and to say, OK, this is we just have to sort of get through this and hope that not more damage is done, or whether you think that perhaps there is more to it than that. So um, um, 
let me see if I can paraphrase. If uh, we didn't think his psychological state was somewhat responsible for the way he behaves, we would start a revolution? I mean, or what, what is it, you, what, what are we supposed to do? I mean, we have a political, uh, we have a, the, 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 the problem we've got is the Republican Party that's supporting him in order to get their tax cuts and other things. So the, the inability to act against him is not, I don't think, caused by our perception of his personality problems. I would say it's caused by the political alignment, the fact that the Democrats are completely uh, in the minority. They have no ability to call a hearing. They have no subpoena power. If the Democrats, praise the Lord, thinking if it's possible, can win the House in, the, in, in November, that's going to change everything because not they're going to they're impeach him, but they're going to have hearings every day. And they're going to have the subpoena power, and they're going to be able to bring out everything the people around him have done. And instead of opening the newspaper in the morning and reading some of his absurd uh, tweets, you're going to have uh, actual evidence of things that are true about his, uh, the people around him. So I think that's, a, that's a, an opening. That's what we should be doing. But I, you know, I, I'm, I, can, I feel like that it could be maybe to talk about him as a person since the, the causes are wider I can understand why that would be somewhat uh, dicey. On the other hand, he, he is, uh, the reason the world is fascinated by him is he's, he is somehow a fascinating person. And the lying is a complicated story. The, the lying is not just simple. It isn't just like disinformation. It isn't just like tricking people. It's like Cheney went in and he told people that Saddam Hussein actually had nuclear weapons. That just was a lie which he did for a certain purpose in order to get a certain vote. He's very strategic. That's not Trump. And what's attractive about Trump, Cheney was never attractive like Trump is to people. And so all of these things, these personality, are part of what, look at that video of him shaving that guy's head. You see, he's excited people in a way that's disturbing, but is, and, and Mike Pence could never do that. So one of the points about getting rid of Trump is, even though Mike Pence is a right-wing guy and has a lot of, crazy beliefs. He has no Pied Piper capacity. He couldn't do what Trump does. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Um, I think that there is a danger of getting caught up in personalities and even vulgarities. If you look carefully at what this man did, what this government did initially, is the deregulation of the American economy, taking away all forms of protection against uh, for citizens, as well as this amazing tax reform that has occurred, which is going to gut the middle class of the United States in such a way that liberalism thrives on a middle class. Democracy thrives on a middle class, and that is what is being affected, in my view. I mean, many people say this is just what Republicans have always wanted to do, and it has nothing to do with him. Um, on the other hand, he's just borrowed a trillion dollars from China, and he has increased our deficit enormously. That's not what the Republicans were going to do. So it, it isn't quite right to say you can take him out and you get the same result. I don't think that's correct. Uh, the you know deficit hawks. Those people had a very strong. There was a very strong coalition in the Republican Party against borrowing, uh, but they did this unfunded tax cut, giving away. You're right, borrowing money from China, pumping it into the American business community, who then uses it to fund Fox News and other things that are spewing lies to the public. It's a that's a very dangerous and terrible thing that's happening. Uh, in part, it's just Republican politics as usual. But there isn't, it isn't quite, and you're, of course, right there, you didn't mention some of the worst things he did, which are the environmental deregulations, where he's pouring uh, uh, poisons into the aquifers, destroying things. Yeah, that, those he did with just decrees. He didn't have to have laws, make laws, which he doesn't know how to do. Um, and that's been terrible, and is, has done permanent damage. And that's awful. I don't think, I'm not, I mean, some of that was just regular republicanism, but all, a lot of his actions have their origin in his desire to erase the Obama presidency. And that's not something that ordinary Republicans had so much. He just wanted to make it go away, to wipe it out. It couldn't happen. 
That's a personal thing. So, I mean, you can say this. How much effect do individuals have as opposed to larger forces? You know, World War I was started by about six people. I mean, it does, like you could say, it wouldn't have happened without those people. Yeah, having uh, one person president versus another person, it makes a big difference, actually. The presidency, we kind of thought in law school that the presidency was an institution. But it turns out it has very little structure. And a person can walk in and treat it like, act like a Central Asian dictator, bring his family in, make money, set up a hotel, sell whatever he's doing. Uh, this is like an incredible thing he's done. It, so it's, a, it's in a way a revolution, revelation to us how weak the institution was, that the norms just dissolved in the face of this guy. And we haven't really come to grips with that. But I mean, I, of course, I understand your basic point that a lot of these things are just, uh, you know, st structural right wing, uh, pro business, tax cuts, you know, make the poor poorer, <laughs> whatever, make the middle class poor policies. Yeah. I was wondering. Sorry. Sorry. I'm sorry. I was wondering um, how uh, inequality and generational change might relate to your story, in particular in relation to how um, accepting the American public might be of, as you call it, sort of this elision of truth and non-truth. And this story would go something like, um, you know, we've built many institutions based on um, ideas about what is true and what is not true that serve certain people and not other people. And this feeling that your truth might not work well for me, um, even for people who aren't necessarily um, extremely racist or, you know, fall into the category that we think of as um, sort of the undesirable, you know, Hillary Clinton's basket of deplorables. Yeah. Well, okay, so uh, class and inequality. His uh, campaign was against immigrants, first of all, who were viewed as somehow mythically competing uh, to, for, with uh, lower middle class Americans for jobs, and they should be kept out. And uh, trade, which was we were sending our jobs overseas uh, and so forth, and they're cheating us and so on. So these are very simple messages, and they were directed not at the elite. They were directed at people who were, in some sense, losers from globalization. One of the bizarre things that Trump says is that America is the greatest loser from globalization, which is like hard to understand what that could possibly mean. But he, to certain subgroups in America, that it seems to be something that resonates. So he's talking a pop, he's populist. He's talking, he's not, his policies are the opposite. <laughs> he's not doing these things. Unlike, say, uh, Kaczynski in Poland. Kaczynski in Poland has a kind of left-wing program of redistribution to the poor. He's giving child credits, and he is actually doing, following a kind of left-wing redistributive program, which built his wallet kind of right-wing authoritarian program where you get rid of the courts, you get rid of the press, and so on, but you have redistribution. So that's not Trump, but Trump talked that way. And part of what got him elected was a feeling no one has been paying any attention to us. The question you have to ask about Trump's victory is not why he beat Hillary, because she was not a good, great candidate, but why he wiped out the Republican establishment in, with, with the back of his hand. And it's because the voters, the Republican voters, viewed the Republican establishment as a wholly owned subsidiaries of the donor class. The donor class in America doesn't care about immigrants and likes free trade. So they were never, those guys were never going to speak anti-immigrant uh, anti-trade to the voters. And so the, so Trump came in, there was a big gap there ready for him. He talked a populist thing. So part of this inequality you're talking about, this growing inequality, which is a terribly destructive thing. We have a system today uh, where the people who, who are making the most money make zero contribution to the country. It's a very, it feels wrong and people f rightly feel like there, there's something wrong with it. And add to this, this is why your generational point is correct. So in 19... 70, I think it was something like 10% of Americans were less, said they were less well off than their parents. That's 1970. In 2010, it's 50% of Americans say they're less well off than their parents, which means there's no, you're not subsidizing patients with the system by claiming that there's a horizon of improvement facing you. And so this is a very anxiety creating. And my friends and I, when we get together, we all talk about, will our kids get jobs? <laughs> it's like, that's the normal conversation. How do our kids get jobs? And what can, so people are, are f fearful 
anxious about this uh, weakening sense of a future, and Trump spoke to that, even though he's not doing anything for them. So that's a different, so he didn't, he, he lies. It's like selling you something, like sells you an apartment. Once you buy it, he doesn't care what happens to it. Uh, he, 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 he's, this is his whole life. He didn't pay his debts. You, you lend him money, he doesn't pay you back. You give him your vote, he doesn't pay you back. Why would he start doing that? No, he's like, and this is why personality is not so irrelevant. You know, he's, that's his personality. Okay. Um, hi, I, I just wanted to ask sort of a, a more of a top-down question. I mean, I, I agree to a large extent with what you're saying, but um, what, I'm, what I'm wondering is like, who, who would you point out to be the supporters of liberalism? Because there's a fair amount of information and a fair amount of um, bubbles, information bubbles on, on both sides, and there are taboo subjects on both sides. So who, who are the people that would start an actual dialogue where legitimate concerns from the right side and from the left side, some of which are incompatible with each other, like who, who are these supporters of reestablishing a fact-based um, dialogue between competing interest groups? I mean, a, 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 part of, a part of what you're referencing is probably due to the fact that um, the, the, the power of the corporate um, in American politics um, is, is very great and arguably on, on, on both sides. I mean, certainly the Democratic Party w was not supportive of um, taking money out of politics and Hillary Clinton in particular. Yeah. I mean, yes, and of course I did say, I did say a mutually uh, non-communicating bubbles with no and I was focusing on the fact that they don't have a common, don't share a common world. Uh, of course, I'm somewhat biased. I think, you know, Paul Krugman is more right than the, than the people who write in the Wall Street Journal. And so this is a, but it doesn't really depend on that. And I, I'm not really here to like show my flag particularly. But it is, you're right, of course, that money is so powerful and that corporations do. The Democratic Party is, uh, is also a wholly owned subsidiary of their donors. Uh, and they can't be bold. And, and they, they should be able to work out a strategy that would be more, uh, more, um, more stronger in their, um, I would say, redistributionist uh, uh, tendencies, but uh, there's a lot of things blocking that, and so um, I'm not, I don't, I don't think America right now has a lot of resources. This is, you know, you can blame people used to blame Bill Clinton for not being not like uh, Franklin Roosevelt that he he wasn't leading a progressive movement in America. He was making all those compromises, but. There was no progressive movement in America to lead. And if you don't have the backers, you can't just do it a few people who are right thinking. You have, there has to be the context. This has to do with the erosion of the labor unions. This has to do with, of course, globalization. There has, there's a lot of things that are involved in stopping this from happening. But I think there is a, right now, uh, this weakness. Well, we're going to see, right, in November, whether the Democratic Party can organize itself in such a way as it can resist some of this. But uh, I'm not, I, I agree, I'm not sure they can. I think there's a real possibility that Trump may be reelected because the Democratic Party is, doesn't have the, the strength of resistance that you're saying I should, uh, I should find the, the bearers of. Anyway. Um, I'm going to allow myself one last question because I want you to end on a little more optimistic note than Trump's re-election, uh, which, because, uh, but, but I'm going to give you the bad news first, and which is Orban has just got himself re-elected and with a thumping majority. Um, and the question is, so yes, if we abstract from the person, what we are seeing is the fragility of liberal institutions, uh, not only in the countries uh, where uh, post-89, uh, uh, the new democracies were established. But as you quite rightly point out, the fragility of the institutions, which comes as a much greater surprise in the US. Coming back to um, governments like the Polish or especially the Hungarian one, the question would be, what should be the kinds of remedies 
that we as citizens, I mean, I am not a citizen in Europe, but as somebody who at least lives in Europe since many years, but what should be the kind of institutional remedies that one could be thinking of. Because we've seen, if you like, the same kind of weakness structurally. The European People's Party has done nothing to put a stop to the kind of dismantling of the rule of law which Orban has been systematically doing, undermining uh, democracy, using the law. So the question is, once a certain majority, uh, parliamentary majority, is attained with elections, which is the case in most of these cases, are we then without any institutional remedies? Or if not, where would we be looking for them? Well, that's a large question. You're right, of course, uh, that uh, uh, the Orban phenomena, I mean, Orban, one of the things he points out when he's claiming, look how decadent Europe is. It's so decadent it can't even punish me. So it, it, sh it shows that how weak it is and why, you know, what is, who are they? And of course, he's got support. There are people in the in Western Europe, say often others, who like him, of course, very much, because he's sticking up for anti-immigration talk. He's popular in much of Europe, among voters in Europe. So it becomes hard. They're going to try now. They, they can't expel, they can't really uh, suspend their voting rights. That requires um, unanimity. There's a chance to change the budget, but I doubt if it's going to happen. So um, you're right, the, the genius of Orban, th those guys, what they did is they were able to become authoritarian using kind of liberal means. Instead of censoring the papers, they bought the papers. <laughs> Inst you know, and then they, they borrowed laws from every West European country and then put them together like a Frankenstein with different pieces. And in, in, in the whole, they're very authoritarian. But anytime anyone complained, they said, look, we borrowed that from you. So it was a kind of mock imitation. Uh, and also, I think another important part of the way he's immunized himself from the West, he said, you guys, what you did to us in the 90s was that you were ruling us from abroad, you were writing our laws, our parliaments really had no say in it. This was a pseudo-democracy, it was a fake democracy, and now you're telling us we have a fake democracy, we're just doing the same thing that you did too. So they, he has, these are, I think, powerful domestic, uh, I'm not. I'm sorry not to come up with an optimistic thing, but you're right. I think they, that Orban was a pioneer in this field, and not only a pioneer in uh, the, these little forms of imitation, but he imitated Western triumphalism. In other words, he said, "History is now on our side. I am the future. We own the future. We uh, the, the, the the wind is in our sails," which is what he was being told in '89 from the liberal point of view. So he's got he's a he's mirror imaging liberal triumphalism in a period where you're seeing like Xi Jinping and Erdogan and so forth. There's a lot of authoritarian success, many authoritarian success stories. And part of the context, of course, in which all of this is happening is that liberal democracy does no longer uh, can claim any kind of uh, really monopoly on the production of economic prosperity anymore because of these other factors, which is an extraordinarily weakening. It does weaken uh, uh, the, the uh, the position of liberal Democrats in this world. But we can hope, anyway. How's that? Okay. Thank you very, very much, uh, Stephen, even if we haven't ended on a really optimistic uh, remedy. But I would like to invite you uh, to come back, if you like, on the 22nd of May, which is when the um, Albert Hirschman Center on Democracy will be hosting a panel discussion on two-speed Europe. And one of the things we will be discussing is the rise of illiberal democracies in Europe and whether they could lead really to a breakup of the EU. Uh, so we're bringing the same debate closer to home. We have a panel with three panelists, the former um, president of Bulgaria, the former vice president of the uh, European Parliament, and a professor of history from Canada. So please come back if you like on the 22nd of May. I look forward to welcoming you and thank you very much for being with us this evening.